Welcome, everyone. My name is LJ Stambuk. I'm the President CEO of the World Affairs Council of Charlotte. And today I have the real pleasure of introducing to you Dr. Cloud Clegg, who is an author, a historian, and professor at UNC Chapel Hill. He's going to talk to us on the important topic of From Africa to America, A Journey Through Black History. Um, thank you so very much, Dr. Clark, for taking time from your busy schedule and being with us here in Charlotte. I understand you have some Charlotte roots, and, and we're delighted to uh, welcome you back to Charlotte. We hope that you will be able to join us in the future in Charlotte in person when the circumstances do allow for that. I think, would like to thank our promotional partners, Tennessee World Affairs Council and Alaska World Affairs Council. Thank you for joining us today. Before I go uh, a little bit about uh, and talk about the World Affairs Council Charlotte, I would also like to thank Rohan Paul, our board member who has actually been the person who has enabled us to have Dr. Clegg with us here today. And I would also like to thank Mike Hawley, World Affairs Council board member as well, who will close this event um, at the appropriate time. So the World Affairs Council is the community's premier global education, nonprofit, nonpartisan organization. And we have always sought to bring the world closer to you and to build a community of internationally informed and engaged citizens. Dialogue, knowledge, active participation, and understanding of global issues are vitally important for our democracy to flourish at all levels. And I might add, understanding of our own history is as important. I would like to introduce to you the World Affairs Council team here in Charlotte. Uh, we have Noah Ameris to the right, then we have Jesse, Jesse Herman to the left, and then we have Charlotte Club, um, and this is the team that has produced over 85 programs since, virtual programs since last March. We're very proud of that, and thank you our members, thank you our supporters for participating and join us. Uh, we today have more than 110 people in this, this program, this webinar, and we really, really want to thank you for your support and participation over this last year and a half, this very difficult time for all of us. Couple of housekeeping uh, affairs to cover. Your microphone will be on mute and your camera, camera will be turned off for the duration of the presentation. We would like you to submit a question and please do, but to do so, please use the question and answer box in the Zoom toolbar. It is circle in red. It is in the middle of the Zoom toolbar, circled in red. Do not use the chat box. If you have a comment for the World Affairs Council staff, please use the chat box. Or for questions for Dr. Clegg, please use the question and answer box in the Zoom toolbar. Again, you see it circled in red here. This presentation will be recorded and we will share with you to your email address. Please make sure you're signed up to receive World Affairs Council emails and that we have indeed your correct email so you can get the recording of this program today. Upcoming programs. We still have a busy June ahead of us. So on June 17, please join us for the World Affairs Council Distinguished Speaker Series with General Retired David Petraeus. He's now a director of the KKR Institute, and he is the former commander of CENTCOM, ISAF, and director of the CIA. He will speak on America's longest war, what the U.S. withdrawal could mean for Afghanistan and global security, and who better to speak on Afghanistan, what's happening there now, and the implications than General Petraeus. On June 19, we have the Young Professionals of the World Affairs Council of Charlotte Meetup in volunteering at Sua Casa African Brazilian Festival with the North Carolina Brazilian Arts Project. This is gonna be a lot of fun. Our young professionals are open to all ages. So we do have people of all ages come and participate. It is not limited only to people between 22 and 40. It is open to all. Join us on June 19, 2021 at the African Brazilian Festival. 
And then on June 24, we have the World Affairs Council Global Health Series with Dr. Derek Raghavan, President of Levine Cancer Institute at HM Health, and Dr. Peter Clark, Urologic Oncology Chair at HM Health, and they will speak on innovation and what's important in prostate cancer. Now, this is a global issue. Uh, I hope you understand, and it is very important. There is a lot of new developments in treatment of and identifying prostate cancer. So please join us on this one and uh, bring your friends and, and family and colleagues who might be interested. We are on all of the social media that you can find. Please do find us, like, share, and follow the World Affairs Council of Charlotte. And I will now turn it over to Rohan, Rohan Paul, a World Affairs Council board member to introduce Professor Clegg. Excellent. It gives me great pleasure to introduce Professor Claude Clegg, Lyle Jones Distinguished Professor in the African, African American History and Diaspora Studies Program at UNC Chapel Hill. I had a, I've had occasion to hear Professor Clegg speak in front of Deloitte's uh, Carolinas practice on more than one occasion on the topic of 400 years of Black American history. And I'm aware that he has done the same for Wells Fargo. Uh, Professor Clegg grew up in Salisbury, not far from Charlotte, but he does have a soft spot for us because he attended Myers Park High School. He did his undergraduate work at UNC Chapel Hill and then his PhD at the University of Michigan at Ann Arbor. He spent 17 years at the Indiana University Bloomington campus, including as chair of the Department of History, associate dean for graduate education, the College of the Arts and Sciences, and associate vice provost for faculty development and diversity. Then six years ago, uh, UNC Chapel Hill came calling with an endowed chair appointment. So he came back to his undergraduate alma mater. Professor Clegg teaches courses in American history, African-American history, and black nationalism. He is, for most, a historian. He we look forward to his presentation today. His latest book is coming out in October, Hope and Theory in the Age of Obama from Johns Hopkins University Press. I believe it's the first biography on Obama uh, since Obama left office. Professor Clegg, welcome, and we look forward to your presentation. Thank you, thank you. Greetings to the World Affairs Council of Charlotte and all others who are attending. Thanks very much, Rohan, for that very kind um, and, and generous introduction. Uh, I'd like to thank the council, first and foremost, for the introduction and the invitation, and for being part of, I think, uh, some very important conversations about some very important issues that are facing our society today uh, and the world uh, at large. Uh, also, I'd like to, in particular, thank uh, L.J. Stambuk, uh, Rohan Paul, of course, Jesse Herman and Mike Howley uh, for helping to make this session possible. Uh, although this session is one about history and historical context, uh, hopefully it will interface with all the other uh, conversations that you all are having. Again, it looks like you have some great programming coming up in regard to General Petraeus, uh, the African Brazilian uh, programming and so forth, a very rich palette of things um, that, that you all have going on. So hopefully the session today sort of interlocks, intermingles with uh, these other conversations that you all are having, important conversations that you all are having um, uh, during the course of uh, a very interesting times in which we live in terms of the pandemic and ideally um, a post-pandemic world that we're entering into. Um, I should say up front a sort of disclaimer uh, that an hour and a half is far too short to cover in any sort of sort of deep or um, uh, substantial way the history of African Americans in this country, which is a 400 year long history. Uh, even when I'm teaching the course uh, or courses in African American history over a semester, which is typically about four months or so, uh, we still just more or less scratch the surface and you have to be really choosy about what you cover during the course and uh, what you assign in the books that the students get uh, that, that information from and what you can't cover, uh, especially in, if you're doing an ambitious course like uh, our talk here today, uh, which is, uh, is extremely ambitious for covering more or less uh, the arrival of people of African descent and the Americas 500 years ago or so, 
uh, till the, the present. So again, uh, I, I don't want to give the impression that you can compress all of that history into a single talk or even a single semester of classwork. However, I, I do want to share and explore some of the major features and moments uh, of African American history with the audience to hopefully inspire further research. Um, you know, hopefully I say something here that sparks uh, interest in uh, uh, some of our attendees wanting to know more uh, about that subject matter or about that particular piece of content uh, and to do their own research, uh, uh, pick up a book, an article, uh, and dig further. Uh, as, a, as a history professor, if, if I can encourage uh, anyone who's listening to, to actually go further than whatever it is that I say or to just pique their interest, I've done my, my work as an instructor. Also, uh, I, I do want to uh, sort of foreground that although African African American history is is sort of North American history, which we'll be covering primarily today during our session, um, it is all kinds of other kinds of history too. African American history is, is of course Southern history, it's U.S. history, it's North American history, it's also world history. It's part of the larger story of humanity. Uh, all histories are. Uh, or part of a larger tapestry of, Amer of, of human history and the human experience uh, that enrich us the more that we know about how our fellow human beings have um, encountered life, encountered hardship, ship, um, had triumphs and setbacks and so forth. So uh, the history that we'll cover today is again at its core, more importantly than just a national history, a history of a particular people, uh, or history uh, of folks moving across time in, in migratory patterns, it's also part and parcel of the human story. Uh, and, and ideally, uh, uh, what we talk here today resonates with you, the audience, in that sort of way. It's, the history belongs to us, to us all. African American history, I always tell my students that African American history does not start in America. Uh, certainly doesn't start in, in slavery. Yes, enslavement is not the beginning of the history of people of African descent. Uh, African American history starts in Africa. Uh, and in particular, when it comes to the uh, descendants uh, or the ancestors of present day African Americans, uh, West Africa and West Central Africa, if you were able to trust the ancestry of African Americans, Black Americans in this country today, and we do have some DNA tools uh, that we can do some of that, uh, you'd find that the vast majority would trace ancestry back to what would be called or designated uh, West Africa or West Central Africa, if you can imagine the West African coast, uh, from what is now roughly Senegal, uh, in sort of the Northwest part of Africa, to what is now uh, the country of Angola. Uh, so again, 85, 90% of present day African Americans, again, their DNA, their ancestry, and their bloodlines would be traceable back to uh, West Africa or somewhere along the coast between West Africa North and West Africa uh, Central. Africa was and is a very diverse continent. It's the second largest continent in the world, second only to Asia. And when I say diversity, I mean, mean it in every single sense. Um, again, if you were to trace back the ancestry of any given African-American today in this country, you'd find many of them came from small villages uh, or farming communities, um, seaside uh, communities, some would have come from powerful kingdoms and sprawling empires, such as the historical kingdoms of Mali and Ghana. Some would trace their ancestry back again to farmers or fishermen or craftsmen uh, or soldiers, prisoners of war, uh, former enslaved people on the African continent. Uh, maybe even just a few, although I, I think um, uh, there are those folks who so I'd like to imagine that they descended from royalty wherever that royalty may reside in the world. Uh, but it may be a few and it would have been just a few who perhaps had some elite um, bloodline or even royal lineage. But the vast majority would have been 
commoners, uh, people again involved in farming or agricultural work, uh, people who are perhaps serving in some sort of military capacity, uh, uh, individuals who, again, if they lived along rivers, perhaps in fishing villages, and again, communities of all, all shapes and sizes. Uh, Africa had, again, a wealth of cultures and has a wealth of cultures. Uh, it's not a single place or a single country. It's, it's hundreds of language groups. Um, today, over 50 different uh, nation states. Uh, and then within those nation states, you know, dozens of, of ethnicities and so forth. Uh, artistic traditions, trade uh, networks um, uh, are also part of African history. And this long before any Europeans showed up along the West African coast in the 1400s uh, in search of fable riches that they'd heard about or eventually uh, in search of slaves to populate their new empires in the Americas, which stretch from, if you can uh, imagine a map of the Americas, North and South America, these empires stretching from the Southern um, um, South America from Portuguese Brazil uh, to British Columbia, British Canada, and of course the islands in the Caribbean are also colonized by various European powers. If you're trying to build a, a civilization, uh, you need two things. One, you need land, of course, and then the Europeans, the Spanish, Portuguese, the British, and so forth who come and claim portions of the Americas, often dispossessing native people there. Uh, so the land is abundant, but you also need labor um, to build a civilization uh, upon. This propels really a sort of frantic search for labor across the Americas and experimentation with different labor systems. First of all, the Europeans who come to the Americas, the Spanish, and then later the, the British and the French and so forth, uh, try to use native indigenous people uh, to satisfy demands for plantation labor, in which they set up plantations in various places. And mining uh, also is big in places like uh, Brazil and so forth. Um, they find that Native Americans die in very large numbers, uh, not only from the abuse of uh, Spanish conquistadors, those who uh, conquered uh, native territories, but also diseases that are brought from Europe. Um, there's also experimentation with white settlers and white settler populations by way of an indentured servitude system, which we won't go into, but it's a kind of unfreedom in which you agree to serve as an indentured servant for a master or uh, a, a, you know, um, an overseer or, or landowner for a period of years. And after your term of service, you'd be given perhaps your own land or, or uh, money to get started in life or you know, passage back to Europe. Uh, all of these systems, as you can imagine, were abused. Uh, and it turned out to be the case that there were too few Native Americans uh, in many of these places who uh, could be pinned in place against, again, Native Americans are at home uh, in the Americas, so they know all the places to, to flee to, to run from uh, Europeans who are still trying to, to discover what the American terrain is about. Uh, and again, large numbers of Native Americans, especially in South America and the Caribbean die from diseases. Uh, white settlers come in too few numbers, uh, willing to be indentured servants to satisfy labor demands in the Americas. So Europeans uh, across the board, whether it's the Portuguese, the British, the French, the Spanish turn to Africa as a source of labor um, uh, that would populate their plantations and mines and farms uh, in the Americas. So it's, and it's, a, it's, the demand fuels the trade. The demand for uh, labor in the Americas fuels a slave trade from Africa to the Americas. Uh, in North America, which is the focus of our attention today, uh, you, by the time the American colonies are founded in the 1600s under the British crown, uh, you see the growth of slavery, especially in Southern colonies. And that would include North Carolina, which used to be just a colony of the Carolinas until it was split into a North and South Carolina in 1715. Um, North and South Carolina, Virginia, um, down to Georgia, 
Um, and also in the North, there was also slavery legal in the col colonies during this time period before the United States is founded by way of the American Revolution in the 1770s and 1780s. Um, uh, the colonies in the South become much more dependent, largely because they, uh, climate-wise, are much more friendly to agriculture and plantation agriculture, these sort of big aggregations of land and laborers and slave laborers and so forth in a single place with a long growing season. Um, so slavery especially becomes rooted in the South. It sort of dies a slow death in the North uh, since there's not this demand for large concentrations of bonded uh, enslaved labor in the North. Uh, and there were uh, enough immigrants from Europe and other places coming to northern colonies to satisfy uh, the labor demands uh, in uh, places like New York and Massachusetts and so forth. Uh, the long and short of it, uh, slavery becomes part of the DNA of the colonies, especially the southern colonies that become wholly dependent upon it uh, as a system of social organization, especially around agriculture. Um, and slavery is a intergenerational, hereditary, racialized system uh, of bondage. So that uh, there, you know, not only was the case that you, you know you were born into the system, but also more than likely you die in the system of enslavement and pass that status of being enslaved to your children and their children and so forth. So uh, it was again, an intergenerational hereditary and above all racialized system of slavery or societal sorting in which you have hierarchies based on race and as well as class and so forth. There were attempts to deal with slavery, to even abolish, get rid of slavery over the 250 years of its existence in the, the, what becomes North America or becomes the United States. Um, these attempts to deal with slavery, to get rid of it, to put it on a you know, path to a, a slow death or to evolve it out of ex existence is halting, is ultimately ineffective, these efforts. However, one enterprise that I did wanna put my, you know, put, put my finger on uh, and share has to do with the founding of Liberia along the coast of of West Africa. Although British rule ended in North America, uh, its rule over its colonies, its 13 colonies along the eastern seaboard of North America ends in the 1780s by way of the American Revolution, this uprising of colonists against British tyranny. Uh, a lot of things survived the revolution and one of those things was slavery this racialized intergenerational hereditary slavery that I, I just mentioned. However, the war against British tyranny, the American Revolution heightened contradictions between the professed noble ideas of the new American Republic as articulated in the Declaration of Independence of 1776 and the US Constitution uh, that was established about 10 years later. Uh, and this, this this thing, slavery, uh, this, this, this human bondage that existed right in the midst of a country that was fancying itself as this new birth of freedom and democracy and so forth. I think that the American Constitution and the Declaration of Independence, they're, they're two of the truly great documents of human history. Our Constitution has proven to be a very durable one. Uh, it's been amended a number of times, uh, but it's been a, a, a durable living document that has been uh, throughout the world emulated and copied by other countries aspiring to be freer or to be more democratic and so forth. So coming out of the American Revolution, you have all of this rhetoric and these documents and Bill of Rights uh, about freedom of the press and freedom of assembly. Um, freedom of, of religion and worship, uh, freedom from search and seizure or unusual uh, uh, punishments and so forth. Um, and a lot of other really great things in this constitution. And then you have slavery, which is sort of the nullification of all these sort of great 
noble principles that are articulated by the founders in this constitution. And there's a there's an uncomfortable fit between the two, right? Uh, that is, slavery kind of does a certain kind of violence to these notions of rights uh, that individuals should have um, and that are guaranteed by the constitution, but are applied in a very limited way, largely to white men with property. Not only was slavery the sort of elephant in the living room, the sort of uh, smudge on this, on this American democracy. Also, race proved to be an irresolvable dilemma for the founders, and not just the founders, you could argue, going up to the present state of things in the country today. Powerful people like uh, Thomas Jefferson uh, imagined that racial differences as he saw them between whites and blacks were simply irresolvable. That is, the problem of race in America was not only a problem of slavery, but it was a problem of the existence of an alien, unassimilatable Black people in, from Africa in America, whose Blackness made them unfit for U.S. citizenship or even freedom. So the thinking went. So it wasn't enough to sort of abolish slavery, but you also had to, in the, in the thinking of people like Jefferson and others who said that the two races could not coexist. You also have to think about what to do with the black population after you free these folks. So motivated by that kind of thinking, that kind of racial thinking about the sort of the irreconcilability of whites and blacks within the same country enjoying the same rights and benefits under the same constitution, okay? That is, those who thought that was an impossibility. Okay. A number of men, a number of these individuals met in December of 1816 in Washington, D.C., the new capital, to form what they call the American Colonization Society for the purpose, and this is a quote from their, their constitution for the organization, to promote and execute a plan for colonizing with their consent, the free people of color residing in our country in Africa or such other places as Congress shall deem most expedient. Although it had this single goal, that is to remove the black population in America to Africa or somewhere else, uh, and again, hopefully resolving the twin dilemma of slavery and also race and racial difference, um, there were a multitude of, of constituencies within the organization, all having this, this single goal, but all having all kinds of, of, of motivations for why they were bothering with this organization and its, and its mission in the first place. Uh, there, were sla there were slaveholders in the American Colonization Society who simply feared that free Blacks set a bad example for their slaves. That is, uh, if you know, with the existence of a small population of free Blacks in the United States, enslaved people who saw that there were these even very small number of free Blacks that might make those enslaved people aspire to be free themselves, which whether that meant running away from their masters, whether it meant open slave revolt and so forth. So there were those slaveholders who had an interest in the American Colonization Society's uh, project of relocating Blacks outside of the United States those slaveholders hoping that the free black population, not necessarily the enslaved population, but the free black population will be removed, extracted from the United States and removed elsewhere. And, in, and ideally, all blacks in the United States would be enslaved. There would not be a free black population and the American Colonization Society would be the vehicle for ridding the country of a free black population and doing nothing about those who were in slavery. So there were slaveholders who had some sort of selfish interests uh, involved in the in their participation in this organization. In addition to slaveholders, um, the American Colonization Society attracted uh, people who wanted to, and I think in a genuine way, ameliorate or improve the condition of Black people in, United, in the United States, where the slaves are free, the small number of free Black people. Uh, there were Quakers uh, in the American Colonization Society who were inspired by what they believed to be Christian duty. They saw slavery as, or human ownership of other humans as uh, the worst kind of violation of the gospel. Uh, and uh, they, as, as they saw themselves as good Christians, needed to do something for, in the language of the day, their fellow creatures, that is, Blacks who were in slavery or, in pre or oppressed in the United States. 
So you had those kind of humanitarian types who were in the American colonization society. You had folks who thought slavery was wrong, but also didn't think that uh, African Americans could really become fellow citizens of white citizens or white Americans enjoying the same kinds of rights. It's back to what Jefferson was saying, Thomas Jefferson was saying that even if you end slavery, there was just too much cultural difference, racial difference and so forth, whether it's moral, whether it's intellectual and so forth between African Americans uh, and whites for you to have a multiracial democracy in this country. So uh, as you were abolishing slavery, and usually these people thought it should be abolished over time and not immediately, you'd be sh shipping those freed African Americans out of the country. Again, you're solving two problems. You're, you're gradually sl ending slavery, but you're also gradually ending racial conflict. Again, the thinking being that blacks and whites were just, it was impossible, an impossibility that they would be able to live in the same society, enjoying the same rights and immunities on any sort of recognizable basis of equality. Um, so, and then there are other types within this organization as well. Um, uh, not only slaveholders and you know, so the humanitarian types, but those individuals who, uh, again, uh, imagine the future of the country as a white future. And, uh, and some of those imagine the future of the country is a free country, but you couldn't have a free country of equal citizens and, and have it be multiracial. So the American Colonization Society, with the help of the federal government, the US government establishes a colony in West Africa uh, in 1822. Uh, and over the course of roughly the 1800s or the 19th century, about 16,000 American Blacks settle in Liberia. Um, most of them are from the South, uh, places like Virginia, uh, North Carolina, Maryland, Georgia. This is where the lion's share of folks come from. And these are folks who, in most cases, were freed by their masters for the express purpose of deportation or, 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 or of sending them out of the state to Liberia. Uh, again, their masters, whatever the reason, you know, that they thought it was a good idea to free their slaves, often they would free them in wheels, that is upon my death, please send my enslaved or formerly enslaved, free my enslaved people, and then put them on ships to Liberia, and I'm going to leave you money to do that. Uh, that was a common way you know, for this to take place. So over the course of the 1800s, about 16,000 American Blacks wind up in what becomes, uh, what was the colony of Liberia, it becomes the Republic of Liberia in 1847, when it becomes an independent country. Uh, along with that population of folks, there are Africans who are taken from, taken from slave ships on the high seas. Uh, by 1808, the transatlantic slave trade from Africa to the United States is illegal. Not slavery. Slavery was legal in this country until 1865. But as of 1808, almost 60 years previously, the United States had declared bringing people from Africa into the United States as slaves as illegal. Of course, with anything that's profitable, you're gonna have people who are gonna break the law, whether it's slaves or whether it's alcohol or whether it's drugs. If there's a demand, you're gonna have suppliers. So the American Navy uh, stops a, a good number of these ships on the high seas uh, and um, takes those Africans on those ships and puts them in uh, what becomes known as Liberia. Um, life in Liberia, and I'll wrap up here for the, I think some Q&A that we'll have. Uh, life in Liberia is tough. Uh, it's a tropical frontier uh, where people are um, having to carve out a life in a place that's unfamiliar to them. By the time that Liberia is founded in 1822, uh, 90 plus percent of Black Americans were born in America. So Africa is not a firsthand thing to them or even their parents. Uh, so they don't have immunity to, for example, uh, common diseases that are endemic to uh, places like Liberia and West Africa, such as malaria, which is a big killer of many of the Black American immigrants who wind up in Liberia. It kills like 20% of all immigrants during the first generation of settlement of Liberia. Uh, 
And then, of course, just as with the Americas, Africa is populated with native people and native kingdoms and communities and so forth. So these Black Americans are going to Liberia and the American Colonization Society is helping them claim Liberian lands which belong to indigenous African people, of course, is a, which is a recipe for conflict. There's, there's no equitable way to take other people's lands regardless of the, the treaties and agreements and things you claim to have uh, arrived at with those folks. So there's tension between local indigenous people in Africa and these black Americans who are coming by uh, the boatload from the United States to Liberia. Um, most of these immigrants coming from the United States to Liberia come penniless. Again, many of them, most of them are former slaves uh, who the, uh, the United States by way of the American Colonization Society are more or less dumping into Liberia without the resources to be successful there. Uh, and Liberia becomes a very fractured society. Uh, it's one in which um, you have uh, African-American or Black American elite that's imposing its will upon a, a larger native um, African population and excluding them from uh, uh, participation in government uh, and societal matters and certain parts of the economy. That is, those Black Americans who go to Liberia during the 19th century reinvent a version of the sort of oppressive systems that they were victims of in America, which is a sort of tragic irony in regard to uh, what takes place in Liberia, which of course those systems don't last forever, which blows up uh, in the later part, latter part of the 20th century. So I wanted to stop there. I think that um, we're scheduled for some Q&A, so I'll turn it over to Rohan Paul. Sure. Um, and what I'm going to do is, uh, I know there's so much more history ahead of us that we may have a shorter Q&A now and do a longer one uh, at the end. So we may have you stop maybe 20 minutes before two and then uh, and give more time uh, at the end. But let me give you two. The first one, uh, I have no idea how you're going to answer because it's such a complicated question. Uh, so the first one from Josh Haynes. I recently saw an infographic regarding how a coastline 100 million years ago influences modern election results in Alabama. The former coastline led to fertile lands, which were prioritized for farming and subsequently slave slavery in the 1800s. And that same zone has a significantly higher current day population of Black Americans, which coincides with the distribution of Democrat and Republican voting districts in Alabama. How can we help overcome the over overpowering effect of rural districts, which are predomin predominantly white, from continuing to influence the daily life and laws that end up disproportionately impacting Black Americans? That is a tough one. And I, I, you know, there are demogra de demographers and, of course, political strategists on both sides of the, the partisan divide trying to figure out those, those, same, those very things, the each election cycle. Um, some things are institutionalized and built in the system. That is, um, our system of government, let's take, for example, the Senate, uh, our U.S. Senate. It the Senate operates with, so there are 50 states and each of the 50 states get two senators. Um, regardless of the population of the state, regardless of how urban the state is or how rural the state is, you get two senators. So you can have a situation like Wyoming, which I think has you know less than a million people in it, and they get two senators. And you can have another state like California that like has 30, 30 million people, and they get two senators. So, you know, you can quibble about the fairness or unfairness, uh, but it's built within the system that uh, you'd have, you know, situations where you have large aggregations of people in very urban states like a California that only gets two senators, and then a very rural state like, you name it, um, Wyoming, Idaho, North Dakota, South Dakota, that gets the same number of two senators. Uh, California, uh, it's a much more diverse state uh, than, let's say, a Wyoming is, uh, which is much more rural and, and, and much more uh, white in regard to its demography. Uh, but again, uh, the Wyoming two senators in the Senate have as much voting power as those two senators from California representing a much more urban, much more diverse, much more numerous population. Um, so uh, that's, that's 
how the system was 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 organized. Uh, it goes to the very beginning where you have 13 colonies and you just had this revolution with the British and you don't want the British to come back and reclaim their colonies and you, you need to get the, all the colonies on the same page in, in case there's a American Revolution part two where the British are coming back. So how do you get everyone, all these 13 colonies to to cooperate? Well, you, you, you have all kinds of compromises. Uh, you uh, you um, have this system in which you know every one of these 13 colonies get two senators regardless of the population. You have a situation uh, with the House of Representatives in which uh, uh, slave states are able to count enslaved people as part of their population to get house seats. So it's a way of compensating a state for having slavery, although those enslaved people could not vote, uh, which gets, gets directly, I think, to the question that the, the the uh, audience member mentioned, you know, how do you have a situation in Alabama or Mississippi? We have all these black people and uh, they are underrepresented in regard to who wins statewide elections, who goes to Congress and so forth. It goes back to a system that privileged slave states. It privileged states with small populations with as much or outsized proportion of representation. Uh, that hasn't been addressed. Uh, certainly there are folks who are, in, and it's not only the, the Senate and the House, but it's also how, how our um, electoral college is organized uh, in so far as uh, you can win the popular vote um, and you can still lose the election because the electoral college privileges these sort of rural states that with lower populations than these much bigger states of bigger and more diverse populations. Um, there are ways to fix it. I think some of it would, would require constitutional amendments, which I'm, uh, the, the bar is so high to amend our constitution that, you know, I don't think we're going to see much of that. And one party has an in interest in the system as it is now. So I, I certainly don't think that party is going to be on board. Uh, but it, it's a problem for democracy um, in which you have a system that really privileges uh, smaller states, states with smaller populations, more rural, rural states uh, with more an, or outsized amount of representation than the more, uh, more populous, more diverse, more urban uh, states. Um, it's been something that's been with us from the time of the founding to the present. Um, and I'm, I'm not so sure, you know, I, I, there are certain, certainly solutions to this, but the solutions require, would require such a heavy lift when it comes to bipartisanship, which I think is just a, too scarce a commodity in the country right now to see anything uh, coming to fruition uh, in the near term. Great question, though. Uh, Professor Clegg, I'm going to make an executive decision just because we've got about 150 years of history ahead of us. And I know there are going to be a whole slew of questions coming in. Why don't we get you started on part two, and then we'll, I'll try to amalgamate the questions uh, for the second half. Okay. All right. And you, you were saying uh, that I, uh, up until about 22? Yeah. Somewhere around there would be great. Okay. All right. Excellent. Thank you, Rohan. So what happens to slavery? Um, Liberia doesn't fix it. Um, all the talk about compromise and, and that sort of thing and the hand-wringing doesn't fix this issue that has been with the country from even before it was founded. It's civil war. It's conflict. It's violence to end slavery in this country. Uh, civil war comes in 1861. It is over slavery. Uh, in, particular, in particular, the question of whether slavery will be allowed to spread into the Western territories. Uh, the South secedes, about uh, a dozen Southern states secede or leave the Union or attempt to leave the Union, which sparks civil war. It goes on for four years. It is the bloodiest war in the history of this country. Um, but it resolves the question. Uh, and it's the 13th Amendment to the Constitution that ends in voluntary servitude uh, in 1865 that officially closes that chapter of the country's uh, um, engagement in, in slavery as an institution. If you're African-American and you're standing in 1865, uh, you can imagine, and some people that, you know, we have some letters and newspaper reports and things uh, from that time period in regard to what free people thought about the period, about that moment. But you could imagine that many of them thought that, okay, uh, so 250 years of intergenerational hereditary bondage, 
without pay or compensation. Um, the war is ended. Uh, it's a war against slavery. The Union side wins. Even there was a good number of African American soldiers who participated in the war on the Union side to help them win. President Lincoln said the war could not have been won without these black soldiers. So, what, what what do we get? That would be, I imagine, the thinking that enslaved people coming out of slavery would have been thinking. You know, uh, it seemed fair that perhaps they would get part of the land uh, that their masters had become wealthy, exploiting the labor of enslaved people to cultivate for cotton and tobacco and rice and so forth, and. During this period, the, 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 the mantra or the sort of catchphrase of the day was 40 acres and a mule. That is, many African Americans came out of slavery thinking that the federal government had promised reparations to fix, to repair, to make whole these people who had been exploited and whose ancestors had been exploited to make the South, the country, wealthy. But that doesn't happen. Uh, the, there's no reparations, there's no land redistributions, there's no payment to people after slavery ends. And enslaved people, now free, uh, leave slavery mostly as a poor people. A poor people, largely illiterate people, uh, uh, people who are not made whole by the federal government, and uh, people who are compelled to look for employment, post-slavery employment, and uh, ver various systems, labor systems that, that replace slavery, but in some instances are sort of reminiscent of slavery. Um, sharecropping is such a system in which former enslaved people would go to a white landowner and agree to work on a plantation. Uh, perhaps their, their ancestors are, perhaps they had themselves worked on these plantations before the end of slavery in 1865, so there'd be a contract. Uh, and uh, they'd share the crop. The landowner would share the crop with the, with the workers. Um, and of course, if you're the, the worker, the sharecropper, you, you're hoping that your share of the crop is enough to you know, pay off the debts that you've accrued for staying on this land owner's property, um, pay off the rents and the, whatever food that's been provided by the landowner over the course of the growing season. At the end of growing season, when you get your share of the crop, it's enough to sell and translate into cash and then perhaps over a number of seasons you are able to buy your own land and get out of this, this sort of sharecropping arrangement. Very few people are able to do that. Uh, there are a good number of folks who are cheated uh, out of their share of the crop during this time period and a lot of other things happen as well. Uh, of course if there was a, a dry season or there were floods and that sort of thing it could impact the share of the crop that you'd get. And this system of of labor organization lasts well into the 20th century sharecropping. It's, it's a really exploited or exploitative system that many of the freed people got caught up in. Um, politically, uh, electorally, there was repression that followed the Civil War. The 15th Amendment to the Constitution, which was ratified in 1870, allowed African American men 21 years of age or older to vote, but that was quickly countered by a number of mechanisms passed by state governments that um, either precluded them from voting altogether or um, uh, made it very, very difficult for them to vote. There were poll taxes, which was just exactly that. You had to pay to vote. So you're asking sharecroppers and poor people to actually pay to vote. Literacy tests uh, for largely illiterate people who were coming out of slavery. Uh, grandfather clauses uh, and, and a number of other things. When those sorts of sort of state gimmicks, state legislative gimmicks didn't work to keep people from voting, uh, there was violence. Uh, groups like the Ku Klux Klan um, terrorized black communities uh, with, with all kinds of violence. Uh, nothing was too low, nothing was too vile. And of course, after the American Civil War ends in 1865, by the 1880s, there's a, there's a period of lynching that takes place in this country up until the modern civil rights period, uh, in which more or less lynchings were designed to be a messaging mechanisms to blacks that the order that you thought was overturned during slavery was not completely overturned. Lynchings are to confirm white supremacy and black inferiority. If there are lines of white privilege and black subordination that are in place. And if you do anything that 
might hint at you getting out of place. And it could be things that we might consider small today, such as arguing with your uh, employer about wages uh, or um, uh, daring to not show up to work or to, uh, to, to, to leave a job or to argue about the truthfulness of a white man's word, uh, joining a union. Uh, there are all kinds of things that could get a person lynched. And again, lynching was a way of sort of confirming that black life was circumscribed uh, in regard to its possibilities. And even though they had been awarded in slavery, white supremacy was here to stay in regard to white privilege over the political system, over the economic system, uh, over uh, life in general in the South, uh, especially where lynchings were concentrated. Along with this picture of electoral suppression and keeping people away from the ballot box and then the violence that was used to keep people in place, a formal system of racial segregation appeared in the South by the late 19th century or the late 1800s. Segregation was, it was a way of preserving white privilege by saying blacks can't go to these schools and they can't live in this area of town and they can't use these public amenities or public facilities and, and they can't work in these kinds of jobs. So it was a way of, of, of preserving white privilege and access to whatever it was, the, the best housing, the best schools, the best employment, the best so public spaces and so forth. But segregation also marked black people as a separate inferior people. That is, they were so inferior that we'd have to separate them out in regard to where they could live, in regard to the kinds of jobs that they could have, in regard to uh, the ballot box uh, or the ability to, to hold office. It was a second class, low quality of, of citizenship that was reserved for, for Blacks uh, segregation. So it's not just the separating of people, uh, but it's the separating of people into in inferior stations in life, whether it's the housing, whether it's the social spaces, or whether it was in jobs and so forth, but also marking them that, th that is their blackness makes them uniquely eligible for this kind of separation out of the American body, body politic and uh, society. Again, if you're, if you're, you know, a black Southerner and you're, you're experiencing this, there are, the, there are a few options. Uh, you can sort of just cope with it and find joy in family and those social spaces and gatherings and churches and so forth uh, that were there. Uh, a good number by the early 20th century decide to migrate. And there's, there's a trickle of Black Americans from the South to the North and the Midwest and the West all along after slavery. There are those people who've had enough of the South. South. Uh, most people don't leave the South. In the South is nothing else for Black Americans coming out of slavery. It is home. So most people don't leave the South, but there's a trickle of people out of the South to the North and Midwest and the West uh, throughout the late 1800s into the 1900s. It becomes a flood by, let's say, the time of World War I. And World War I helps trigger this, primarily because uh, of the need for factory labor in urban industrial cities in the North and the Midwest as the country goes to war uh, in Europe. Uh, need for steel, uh, need for guns and uniforms and foodstuffs, uh, and meatpacking industries in places like Chicago. Uh, and again, uh, a, a thirst for labor for those factories that is not satisfied by the usual laborers in those cities, which is primarily white laborers, many of whom are going off to war in Europe. Uh, so it is during this time period, during the World War I period and afterward, that you have what has become historically known as the Great Migration of African Americans and a good number of white Southerners too. Out of the South and into these urban areas, it's during this time period that you see substantial Black communities in New York and Philadelphia, uh, in Detroit, uh, Boston, Charlotte, Atlanta, uh, even in the South, there's a lot of migration from rural South to urban South. So places like Jacksonville, Florida, Atlanta, Georgia, Washington, DC, Charlotte, uh, Raleigh, and so forth get uh, augmented in regard to their populations of, uh, and in particular in regard to the black populations of those places. Migration is a mixed 
picture for Black Americans uh, with mixed results. And there's a mixed re reception as well. Um, unlike the legalized segregation in the South, which was written into law, uh, segregation in other regions, the Midwest, the North, uh, West Coast was more informal and customary, um, although it could be just as rigid. So uh, although African-Americans could ride the trolley car or uh, they could vote in many instances, uh, segregation was still um, in play. Uh, and there, again, there were formal and sort of customary ways of, of keeping places like Chicago uh, um, uh, segregated so that African-Americans are concentrated in the south side of Chicago, even to this day. Um, things, you know, part of this system of informal segregationist policy, things such as restrictive covenances, uh, which were written into people's titles. Uh, so that, let's say there's a entirely white neighborhood and people in that neighborhood wanted to keep it that way. They would have a restrictive covenants added to the title of the house. So if they sold that house, the, the clause, the restrictive covenants in the title would say this house cannot be sold to Negroes. On occasion, you'd find restrictive covenants that said that this house cannot be sold to Jewish people. There's a good, a great amount of, of anti-Semitism um, uh, uh, sentiment uh, in this country in the, in the early 20th century um, that has lingered, of course. Uh, so that was one way, the restrictive covenants. Uh, those aren't ruled illegal until the mid 20th century. Redlining by banks, which is a, the discriminatory practice of financially isolating areas where banks simply did not invest. They didn't think that it was a good investment to invest in the South Side, to invest in tenement housing, to, uh, to invest in places that had large concentrations of poor people, especially poor Black people, uh, with the understanding that to invest in those places was taking a risk, especially when so much of the policies and informal practice or the practices were anti-Black. Uh, that is, Blacks were limited in regard to their access to housing and to health care and to uh, political power and so forth. You know, banks were making the financial decision, why would you invest in those sorts of areas among those kinds of people uh, if the return uh, would not be there, the return on investment would not be there. And then you had within the real estate industry, uh, block busting, which was more or less a, a scaring people, scaring especially white neighborhoods, uh, white residents to sell their property. A, a, real, a realtor might you know, go into a neighborhood and, and say, well, the blacks are coming. You know, they, they're gonna be buying your houses or trying to buy your houses. You might as well sell now. Uh, even, if you, even, even if you have to sell at a, at a price that you otherwise wouldn't wanna sell for, sell now and make something on your investment and get out of here. Uh, go to another area where you know, black, the, the black um, homeowners won't be coming. And a good number of folks fell for that. They sold their houses, often sold them at a loss. The realtor would then turn around and sell that same property at marked up prices to black residents who'd be coming in. Okay. Uh, that was called blockbusting. And what would happen is that you'd have a transition of a, of a community from entirely white land owners who sold their property at a loss to incoming black land owners who bought the properties marked up beyond often the, the value and so forth. Only the realtor really uh, made off with any sort of benefit here. And then there's, all, uh, there's also the, the constant threat of violence against Blacks who even dared to try to move into a, a community that our neighborhood and that was entirely white. You, you really took your life into your own hands. Even if you, you know, had the class status, uh, had the income, uh, had the wherewithal to buy a house in such a neighborhood, Again, uh, uh, racism among many of the residents of those neighborhoods uh, could often become violent. Uh, you could find your house firebombed, uh, you know, crosses, Ku Klux Klan crosses burned in your yard and that sort of thing, which is not uncommon for those blacks who dare venture outside of uh, parts of town that had historically been reserved for, for blacks. And there were other forms of segregation. I know our time is limited, so uh, we won't be to go too far, but there was, there was 
Segregation, of course, housing. If the housing is segregated, it probably means the schools are segregated as well, the local schools, which probably means the employment situation is segregated and Blacks were shut out from many jobs, largely by unions that did not allow Black workers to, to participate in unionization, which of course hurt all workers. That is, if you're, if a, if you're a union only organizing certain workers, then it was easy for employers just to go and hire the ununionized workers at lower wages, which depressed the wages of all workers. And that was a, that's been a hard lesson for, or it was a hard lesson for unions to, to learn. And that is to get past their own sort of racial feelings, racial animus towards black workers and, and organize all workers so that employers, corporations couldn't play workers off against each other. It's one of the reasons that, that unions to this day in the South are weaker than any other part of the country. It's because race has been historically played um, uh, up by, by corporations um, to bust unions uh, and to appeal to the racial uh, uh, animus of white workers and say, you know, you, you really shouldn't be organizing with black workers and so forth. And again, to depress the wages of all workers. Uh, again, a legacy of this time period, again, is that the United States, or that the Southern states, North Carolina included, to this day have the weakest unions in the country. A watershed moment, I think in human history, period, because it's the bloodiest war in the history of humanity, and hopefully it's the last such war, is World War II. Uh, World War II does a number of important things. One, it confirms the United States as a global superpower. And for a moment, a few years, as the global superpower. The United States is on the winning side, comes out of World War II, um, um, economically prospering. Uh, World War II helps to bring the country out of the Great Depression of the 1930s and early 40s uh, by the demand for war material and, and, and things related to fighting the war. And it comes out of the war with this, this new weapon, uh, the atomic bomb. Uh, which it uses to end the war with Japan in August of 1945. So the United States is this global clear winner of the Second World War superpower uh, that helps to draw, to redraw the post-war, the post-war maps of the world. And of course, launches, us, uh, launches the country into the Cold War with the Soviet Union. World War II didn't fix a few things. And one thing it did not fix was the situation, the racial situation at home. Um, black veterans returning home, uh, especially going back to southern states, still couldn't vote. Segregation was still the law of the land across the South, especially, and widely practiced. Uh, there were race riots even during the war when black soldiers were abroad fighting in the name of American democracy. Uh, lynchings were still not a thing of the past at the end of the war in 1945, and there were inequities across the board when it came to racial inequities, such as housing and wages and schooling and educational attainment and access. One thing the war did was to raise expectations. That is, if you had just risked life and limb for your country, fighting Nazis, fighting fascism, uh, in the name of American democracy abroad, uh, in the Pacific and in Europe, um, Chances are you might come back to the country expecting to enjoy some of those, those things here in this country. Democracy, human rights, human dignity, dignity, all the things that the United States said it was fighting when it was fighting against Hitler or Mussolini or fighting against the Japanese empire in the Pacific. So there's this, this juncture again between expectations, high expectations that the country is gonna live up to the promise of its creed, all these wonderful principles stated in the constitution and all this, this glorious wartime rhetoric about defeating Hitler and the Nazis and, and overthrowing uh, the Japanese suppression of Asian people in the Pacific and making the world safe for democracy. There are those who actually believe that, what the US government was saying and veterans who came home from the war who wanted their country to live up to the promise of its ideals, uh, of its creed. And this would lead us into the civil rights movement of the 50s and 60s, these high expectations that the country could and should do better. Um, the civil rights movement accomplished a great many things. 
Um, there was the Civil Rights Act of 1965, which got rid of segregation in public life. Uh, this is the, there was the Voting Rights Act of 1965 that finally opened the country up more than it ever had been to African Americans voting at the ballot box and, and running for public office and so forth. Um, and in the wake of the civil rights movement of the 60s, you have educational institutions such, such as my own, UNC Chapel Hill, uh, opening up educational opportunities for black students coming in uh, in larger numbers than they had previously uh, been allowed to. There's a black middle class uh, that emerges in states and regions populated not just by, as it had historically been populated by more or less preachers and teachers, but by doctors and lawyers and professors and entertainers and, uh, and, and so forth. So it was a watershed moment, uh, just as World War II, which was the opening, the raising of expectations of what the country should be doing domestically for the civil rights movement, uh, changing a lot of minds, not all minds, but changing a lot of minds in regard to uh, the place of African Americans in the society. It doesn't fix everything and, and almost never does even a, moment, a, a momentous movement or period of time uh, fix all the problems that are in a society. Sometimes new problems are created or old problems are made more complicated. So you still have big pockets of rural poverty among African Americans in the South, uh, urban poverty in the North. Uh, you still have racial differentials when it comes to unemployment rates, uh, wages, um, uh, during this time period, housing access, underfunded schools uh, continue to be more or less the norm across the country when it came to African Americans. Um, under-policed or poorly policed, uh, crime infested poor areas in the North in particular, uh, and just a lack of attention paid to the situation uh, of African-Americans for whom the civil rights movement with all its promise of access did not address these things. Uh, on top of that, you have a backlash uh, among whites, many whites in this country, conservative backlash in which many flee urban areas, taking with them much of the tax base, uh, which would have been great for bolstering public education, uh, public services, uh, and, and so forth, leaving many Black residents who were already impoverished, even in a more difficult situation. By the 1980s, we have uh, uh, a sort of a raft of get tough crime policies uh, that uh, give us our uh, inca mass incarceration system now. Um, that made it with the crack epidemic, which is made it with poverty and lack of opportunities in many urban areas, which spurs along an HIV AIDS crisis that ravages poor communities. Uh, all of these things sort of in a, in a tragic stew that affects especially African Americans in the lower tier, that's sort of the underclass of urban society and also rural uh, stretches in the North and in the South uh, uh, who were not pulled out of poverty, pulled out of poor schools, uh, bad housing, uh, provided healthcare and so forth uh, and the numbers that uh, uh, would have made a, a difference. So by the 21st century, there, there's more or less two, I'd argue many more, iterations of Black America in this country. There's that one that's idolized in, let's say, the Cosby Show of the 1980s, where you have Black professionals, well-educated uh, in, in, in various professions, such as legal profession, as engineers, engineers and management, and professors, um, sports, entertainment world. Uh, you have Blacks holding offices uh, across local, state, and federal government. Um, you know, attorneys generals, secretaries of state, um, commerce, labor, energy, currently have a defense minister or defense secretary who's African-American, agriculture, education, a black president uh, as of in 2008 and a vice president now uh, who is of African ancestry as well. Um, high school graduation rates among African-Americans uh, in the 20th century, 21st century have more or less match those of whites, more blacks in colleges and universities than any time in American history. So you have that 
iteration of Black America that truly benefits from the civil rights movement and the fruits of the civil rights movement and the opening up of American society in ways that had not been opened up uh, previously. And then you have this other Black America, um, which you see in the statistics. It's the one that uh, has too many single women um, heading up households, uh, too many infants born outside of marriage, which is a recipe for poverty in and of itself. Uh, unemployment rate, a rate is that is at least twice and sometimes more than that uh, of the white rate, especially among black males in urban areas. Uh, you have the poor schools and that inadequate social services and family supports, the disastrous warm drugs that uh, throws the book at low level offenders, nonviolent offenders, and gives me these people very stiff years long sentences in prisons uh, before anyone's ever thinking about um, drug addiction as uh, a sickness, as is the case with opioids now. Um, uh, the thinking has turned the corner that this is an illness that needs to be treated with public health and public services as opposed to just throwing the key and locking away folks. That was not the thinking uh, during the crack epidemic when it uh, affected black communities in the late 20th and 21st century. It was criminalize all of this and throw the book at the users, the traffickers, uh, uh, and, and, and no matter uh, what they were, what their level of participation in this drug culture, this drug culture was. Uh, our pandemic, the last word, our pandemic is laid bare uh, within the last, 18 months or so, these historical uh, inequities in regard to you know, Blacks being more uninsured than whites, especially in places like the South, and thus not being able to get early treatment for that cough or that loss of taste in the mouth, these telltale signs of affliction by COVID-19. Uh, Blacks being overrepresented in jobs uh, that would not allow remote um, work. Uh, Frontline jobs, service industry jobs, the people working in the restaurants, the people who are working in the driving the public um, transportation buses and the construction work, jobs that simply went away um, in the midst of the pandemic when the country shut down and didn't, didn't, weren't able to translate or transfer onto some remote online medium. Um, African Americans, Hispanics also were hit hardest by the eviction. Uh, of, of people uh, from their housing, from their apartments and so forth in the, in, the, in the wake of so many people losing their jobs by way of the pandemic. So the, the pandemic and then of course, instances of police brutality, um, which are captured. We have a large unfortunate archive of video of all kinds of brutality against African-Americans and George Floyd, I think is a sort of seminal event in May of, 2020, this sort of slow strangulation of, of this man under a policeman's knee in uh, Minneapolis, Minnesota. Um, it, it sort of is the last straw for a lot of folks uh, across the board. It's sort of national, cross-racial, global outrage about how could this happen in a country like America where you could have a videotaped over nine minutes, this man who's killed on the streets by a law officer who is supposed to protect and serve. Uh, so our moment, I think, is a very fraught moment uh, in regard to a lot of different things, whether it's in regard to uh, racial, e racial equity, in regard to income inequality, in regard to voting rights, uh, in regard to public health, uh, and whether or not health care is a right in this country, uh, in regard to climate change, what's the health of our planet, and so forth. Um, I'm made more optimistic cautiously so by the young people. Um, uh, they when they have the most invested in what happens now and in the near future, in the distant future, they have the most invested in what happens now in regard to racial equity and, and racial justice. And they have the most invested in climate change and voting rights and healthcare access, now educational system uh, and so forth. Um, and I can remember very vividly those pictures of protests during 2020 and sort of a rainbow of colors of black people and white people and people of Asian descent, Native American and Hispanic and so forth, uh, protesting not only what had happened to Mr. Floyd, 
but protesting in regard to the country needing to do better on a number of different levels, whether it's addressing the pandemic itself and unemployment and healthcare excess and so forth. So I, I cast my lot with the young people uh, with, with uh, their um, the idealism, um, their willingness to protest, uh, to be activists, to demand better of the country. And, and I'm hopeful that the country will rise to that occasion, uh, prodded by, by uh, good people of all backgrounds. Thank you. Professor Clegg, we really appreciate that. I know there's a host of questions that come in, some of which actually were answered in your part two. Okay. But uh, let me start with one quick question as a historical fact before we get into these, which is the GI Bill, I always thought it would apply to all American soldiers. Is that not the case, that it only applied to white soldiers or did I get that wrong? Um, Yes and no. Uh, so the yes part is that ideally anybody who's a who's a veteran uh, was eligible for the GI Bill coming out of World War II. Um, and this helped people pay for college tuition, it helped with the mortgage and so forth. So it was to thank these soldiers who risked life and limb for the country um, to say thank you to our veterans, which I think every country should say that to the people who defend it. Um, there, of, of course, if it's the case that you can't, you know, it's very hard to get a mortgage in the first place because banks won't give you a mortgage and the federal government is not compelling those banks to be fair, then the GI Bill is not that helpful. If it's the case that you can't get into many schools uh, in regard to because they weren't allowing African American applicants to go to most traditionally white schools, uh, the GI Bill doesn't help very much there as well. So you have these institutionalized forms of, of discrimination that are at play in the housing market and mortgages and who gets a mortgage and who can live where and schools and who can go to what school and what school will admit what kinds of candidates. And again, so the quality of the GI Bill in the hands of a, a black veteran is a much lower quality uh, than it is in the hands of a white veteran. Uh, who ideally would come back and marry and have children and go back to school and get a profession and get a nice home and so forth. Again, so there are, even though the GI Bill has the best of intentions, these, these, there are these systemic things in regard to, again, the mortgage market, the housing market, you know, the educational market, uh, employment, uh, long-term patterns of poverty that, again, make the GI Bill of lower quality when it comes to to black veterans, it's a good question. Thank you very much for that. Um, Richard Lancaster's question is, please compare the current legislative climate of recreating laws that suppress the vote, reduce freedom of assembly, restrict what is taught in schools, increase gun rights and restrict rights to compete in sports by marginalized groups to the post reconstruction period. Oh, wow, <laughs> wonderful question. Um, I think someone much wiser than I, maybe it's Mark Twain, the writer, said that, um, History does not repeat itself, but sometimes it rhymes. And I think that's what we're kind of seeing now. That is, we're not in a period that's a mirror image of Reconstruction. Uh, this period of you know, 15 years after the American Civil War between around 19 or 1865 and the late 1870s. That's the, Re the Reconstruction period where there's all this experimentation regarding uh, black rights and citizenship and enfranchising black men. And then the reaction to that, as we talk, I talked about earlier, uh, the grandfather clauses and the poll taxes and so forth, trying to roll back black rights. Uh, so it's, it's not, ex you know, it's, it, it would be much worse to live in that time period in the 1870s and 1870s than to be African-American in 2021. Uh, but, some of the things that are going on are very reminiscent. That is this effort to restrict voting rights um, in regard to um, you know, mail-in voting, in regard to um, um, early voting, um, in regard to having um, IDs and so forth. You know, there are those who say, well, you know, that, none of this stuff is really discriminatory. But if you dig a little deeper, you'll find that the kinds of IDs that are required by many voting places, uh, African Americans and Hispanics and young people who tend to trend Democratic uh, have less access to those kinds of IDs uh, than others. 
um, you'll find that voting early is disproportionately more um, popular among African Americans than other American voters. And so when a state decides it's going to cut early voting, um, it's, in my view, it's a very purposeful attempt to make it harder for certain demographics, African Americans, to vote. Uh, for example, in Florida, just th to throw one case, there was a, there's a move many years ago to get rid of voting that Sunday eve before the election. Our elections are on Tuesdays, they tend to be. So uh, in Florida and in other places, there's a souls to the polls that Sunday, you know, where the church would you know, get a bus and everybody show up to the polls and vote early. Um, the Republican legislature in Florida really attacked that. And there've been other states too. And of course the thinking was, or the, the rationale was, well, you know, people don't need to vote on Sunday anyway. And this because we're getting rid of Sunday voting doesn't mean that there's any sort of racial element to it. But of course, if you look at that, that single day of voting, African-American voters in Florida voted disproportionately in higher numbers on that souls to the polls Sundays right before the uh, election than they did on other days. So uh, it, it is reminiscent, those, these current efforts that we see are reminiscent of you know, some of the machinations and trickery, electoral trickery that we saw uh, over a hundred years ago in the wake of reconstruction. Um, and I think it makes this a particularly dangerous moment for American democracy. Um, whether you look at the January 6th insurrection at the Capitol um, or, you know, candidates who refuse to, to concede an election and, and, and they cast aspersions on the validity of elections, on, you know, voting machines and on state officials and call up states, you know, you know, call up state officials and tell them to find votes and that sort of thing. So I think that we're in a American democracy as it was during reconstruction in the late 19th century is in a very crucial but dangerous time, um, um, which I, you know, I try to be an optimist about these things. I think we will weather. But I don't think that these things will just fix themselves without people of good conscience and goodwill pushing back against some of the things that we're seeing that limit the right to vote uh, for folks uh, who are, I think, assumed to be partisans of a particular party. Uh, and then more or less the, the, the name of partisan advantage, one party getting partisan advantage by limiting access to the vote on the part of people that they presume are gonna be voting for the other party. So yeah, that if anything really raises the hair on the back of my neck in regard to um, our politics is uh, the sort of rush by various states to make it harder for people to vote. Uh, and then uh, the effort of, of folks in various quarters to, to say our system is rigged and is flawed and you know, if my party didn't win, then the whole vote must have been rigged and we need to, you know, we need to recount and send in folks to, you know, do forensics on the ballots. And I, I, I think that, again, it's reminiscent of what happened in Reconstruction. And I think the danger also uh, that the country faced in the midst of Reconstruction is a danger that we face now in regard to the durability of American, the American experiment in democratic, democratic government. It's a great question. Thank you. Um, Charles Pringle asked, um, what steps should be taken to educate people on black history and integrate it into the standard curriculum? And I'll give you my personal example. Last Memorial Day weekend, we were at the Atlanta Center of History and they actually documented over the course of the last hundred years, the four different versions of the history of the South that came up. Their first version was it, the war had nothing to do with slavery to now it was all about slavery. And slowly getting to that point over four different versions that people saw when they visited the museum. But what's your take on that? Yeah, I, I think that that's one way to do it. There's some really quality work taking place in a lot of quarters, uh, museums uh, and historical associations, uh, some schools, some campuses. Um, there's a ton of books uh, in, on US history, African-American history, Southern history, history of slavery, um, so a, a person who really has an interest, it won't find a lack of resources uh, now compared to let's say 100 years ago where you'd be hard 
hard pressed to find good history books uh, on African American history truthful ones. So there's there's that uh, you know your local library um, you know a lot of good work that's out there in regard to getting the story. Um, I, I but I I think that again this is a all times are unique, and I think this is a particularly unique time for American democracy. That is, the notion of truth and facts uh, are under assault, and for all kinds of reasons, much of it is partisan reason, but also there's 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 uh, social tensions around race and other things that are part of that, and cultural tensions around race and around the, the demographic changes that we're seeing in the country. Um, and again, the sort of partisan use of race, of facts, of history, the, the whole uh, critical race theory uh, debate uh, that's going on. You know, whoever thought that, uh, you know, uh, that we'd be talking about critical race theory and, and so, mm -hmm. you know, high, high placed politicians would be talking about this. Um, so uh, there's a lot of misinformation and disinformation. Disinformation being purposeful attempts to provide us with falsehood in fact uh, uh, falsehoods and and um, things that are not true uh, our media system that is the fact that there's so many different ways to get information whether it's social media it's Facebook it's Twitter it's the internet it's YouTube and so forth in addition to traditional ways uh, to get information makes it more incumbent for us to be more sophisticated in how we view information and where we get it from and the, how credible the sources are, are that we're looking at and so forth. Uh, so we have two things going on. That is the, prolifer the proliferation of information across various media uh, makes it possible for us you, for you to find out, uh, answer a question to most anything at your fingertips. Uh, but the dark underbelly of that is because there are so much noise out there, there's so many outlets, so many blogs and websites and, you know, there's so much of that and so, uh, there's, there's much more to filter through and to filter out and to be able to, over time, develop your own filter of, for filtering out misinformation and disinformation and being able to determine whether a source of information is credible uh, and factual and so forth. Uh, it makes me feel a bit sorry for young people, uh, uh, school-age people who, when I was in school, if it didn't come out of a book or an article or something on TV that, that you know, those three stations covered, um, then, you know, that wasn't really the only source of information. But now there are so many sources that require you to be much more sophisticated about the places that you get information from and that information as as evidence of anything. But again, I think there are great, there are a lot of great books um, out there, great articles, news sites, as Rohan was saying, museums, there's some fantastic museums doing some great work, including the one in Washington, DC, uh, the, the, the National Museum of African American uh, History and Culture. Uh, so I, again, it's incumbent upon us to come up with better filters um, and that'll get us at better information and better sources of information as well. That's a Thank you very question. much. We really appreciate it, Professor Clark. Let me turn it back to LJ uh, to conclude uh, the program today. Thank you so very much. This was such an excellent, excellent presentation and discussion. I'm sure there are more questions and probably people will ask us if they can send you an email with their questions. And if you allow us to share your email at, uh, at UNC Chapel Hill, we'll, we'll do so. But thank you for your time. Thank you for your presentation. We all learned so much. Uh, this should be the first of a series of, of uh, conversations we have on uh, Black history. And um, I would like to turn it off over to uh, uh, Michael Holy, uh, former chairman of the board of the World Affairs Council of Charlotte and board member of the World Affairs Council of Charlotte. Mike, it's all yours. We can't hear you. You're on mute. You're on mute. Mike, you're on mute. There we go. I'm, 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 I hope I'm live now. Yeah, thank you, uh, Lou Mayor and uh, Dr. Clegg. That was uh, 
uh, an incredible display of uh, uh, capsulization of history. Uh, it was uh, just really, really terrific. So thank you very much for that. Thank and, you, uh, you know, uh, Rohan and I are very proud to be a member, uh, members of the board of uh, the World Affairs Council. And I'm confident that uh, all the people on the call today uh, who are members are very proud uh, to be members of uh, the World Affairs Council. Uh, you know, this is what we do. Uh, history, culture, context, uh, global thinking, that's what it's all about for us. And, and uh, this has been a ter terrific uh, display of that uh, today. So uh, with that, uh, I would ask, as we always do, that uh, uh, for folks that are on the call today, uh, even if you're from Tennessee and Alaska, uh, we would love uh, for you to be members of the World Affairs Council of Charlotte. Uh, and uh, certainly if you're uh, local, uh, we'd love for you to be actively involved uh, in what we do. And uh, with that, I will just uh, uh, close us out. And Lou, Mary, is it okay to go ahead and adjourn this meeting? Yes, absolutely, Mike. Well, we are adjourned, and thank you again, Dr. Clegg. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you so very Clark. much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.